In words, out words. In words, out words. My name is Kitty um, Kiefer, and I've signed up because I was asked to, and I hope to be asked again because already I like this. Um, <laughs> And, and like, it must be August, it must be beautiful out, which is why we have um, mostly us performers here. So we'll have to be very, very friendly to all of us other performers, okay? Um, Denise and I have gone over the list. And Denise says I can take as much time as I want. So I think I'll probably take three minutes, right? And that, that should fit into everything. Um, at the end, Andres will do announcements. Does that make sense or do you have sure. something now? Sure. Okay. Sure. Okay. At the end. So um, the theme. Uh, I never knew that the host got to pick the theme. So when Denise said, "Would you like to do this?" I write from prompts. Laura, the artist up here, and I and some other women write together all the time. And so we're always doing prompts. And um, so I thought, "Oh wow, I can pick a prompt." So I thought and thought and thought and thought and came up with crescendo not knowing what would happen. I love it when a prompt does things that <clears throat> everybody does something different. So the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to say the first person and the second person and then sit down and then the, the first person comes up and then so it's all the way through. Um, we'll see how it goes when we get in the middle. Anyway, we're going to start with Amelia. Sidolowski, and then we're going to do Sonia. I'll try my last name. <laughs> well, I tried. I tried. Let it go. Right. Well, how do you say it? Sidlowski. Sid Sidlowski. Okay, so I made it Sidlowski, and then um, Sonia, I can't even read my own writing. Sonia Pilser will go after, okay? Okay, everybody. It's August. It's August 1st, right? Yes. That's a Leo time. <laughs> That's when the sun is bright and we we rain. <laughs> we Leos. I'm a triple Leo. And um, even more planets in Leo, but I don't remember them all. And then I have things in Taurus, which is an Earth sign. So I have oh, Earth and fire. That's who I am. I'm grounded but I like to be out there. <laughs> you doubt? <laughs> um, anyway, that's what's been my, all these years, and I couldn't understand why I had both of them and how come it was so depressing for many years. But I've gone through that and I'm on the other side of it. And I love my birthday. I was born at 6.08 a.m on August 4th. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, so in the summertime, the sun is up at 6.08. And it's a beautiful time of day. And so what I do is, well, I'll tell you how it started first, and then we can talk about what I do. Um, when I had the restaurant, we, would, we tried this overnight thing open all night trying to get business there and trying to figure out something. So anyway, I'm in there all day long and all night long, and I'm pretty exhausted. And so I said, I'm going to take a break. It's about 5, 15, 20, something like that in the morning. So I go out for a walk. And um, I'm walking down Bleecker Street. And it's a time of morning where the bars have closed and everyone who hung out have gone home already. They're not hanging, you know? And so it's usually very quiet and the streets are pretty empty. And I'm walking and walking and walking. And eventually I hear footsteps behind me. And I'm starting to not like it. Yeah. And I'm walking, I'm walking, I'm walking, still behind me and still behind. Now, I had no idea. I didn't turn around. I guess I was too frozen to even find out who was behind me. Um, but I started feeling more and more uneasy. And so I get to one of the corners, I think it was Perry Street, and I take a quick left turn down Perry Street. And we, there are brownstone buildings there, and they have a front door 
that opens to anyone. And then inside is a door that you can't get in unless you ring somebody's bell. And if they're expecting here, it's five in the morning, you don't ring a bell. So I'm in there and I duck down below the glass so no one can see I'm in there. And I'm pretty, con you know, I'm pretty like, hopefully whoever it was did not see me, did not see me come in, get in the door and they would go somewhere, they would pass. And there was no way for me to know for sure. But um, I waited and I waited and I waited and finally I figured, well, um, I would think that by the time they sort of got tired of what they were doing and they didn't find me and they went home or did whatever. Um, but what I became aware of is, it was like, to me, it was an idea of the birth canal because it was coming onto my time of birth at 6.08. I couldn't go out because it was scary out there and I couldn't get in. <laughs> And I'm sitting there in the middle of it all and terrified. And it was like, I must have felt this when I was born. <laughs> you know, <laughs> who the hell is out there? I don't want to go there, but I can't get back in. They won't let me back in. Yep. So eventually I opened the door and I left and I looked around and no one was there. But it became so clear to me how poignant at the time of my birth this was happening. And so I've always been aware of that. And um, so what I've been doing from then on is I always find myself out before 6.08. I'll go there at 5.30, quarter of 6. And what I like to do is think about the preceding year and all the wonderful people and experiences in my life that year. And I'm kind of like, acknowledge it and know that you know my life was not empty it wasn't useless or whatever that there were people in my life who cared about me and um, were there for me in any way they were um, I also when things happen I write little notes about it and I put it in a jar so that when I'm really depressed I can reach into the jar and say this one did that and that one did this <laughs> you know and I'm good I'm good you know so it, it moves me, but I, so I do that before 608. I think about all the, all the lovely people in my life, even the people in IWOW, you get mentioned, you do. And, um, and then at 608, I step into my new year. And um, I'm also nude, and I wear this uh, beautiful uh, kimono, a silk kimono. And before tick, tick seasons, I used to walk in the grass in my backyard and sort of like, you know, but I don't go out there. I stay on my deck and I watch whatever. Um, and then I walk into my new year and then I either think about, you know, what I would like to have, what would I like to create in the new year? And that's how I and I leave my old year into my new year, and um, yeah. So six oh eight is on its way, <laughs> and that's what I plan to do. But thanks. To you. No, someone. So now we have um, Sonia Pilzer, and after that, um, Jean Bassi. Jeannie Bassis. Jeannie Bassis. Jeannie Bassis. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Hi all. What do they call August? The uh, something days? The dog days. So it's the dog days. Okay. So when I first heard the prompt of crescendo, it didn't do anything for me. Um, but then I started thinking about it. 
And this is sort of what I came up with. The it's beginning. starting to grow on you. <laughs> the music of the word is what gets to me. Crescendo. Dragging the syllables for as long as I can. Crescendo. It's yeah. meaning a gradual increase in volume and intensity secondary to its sound. And I study piano. Crescendo, the sheer onomatopoeia, which leads me back to early work. As I've said before, I have this sheaf of poems from the 70s. The page is yellow, yellow, my beloved Olympia typewriter. How I learned to be a writer by listening to the words and how they fit with each other. So here's a little bit of onomatopoeia, however it's pronounced. Mm -hmm. Okay. Written quite a while ago, but I still like it. The quirk, and by the way, um, one of the things that interests me and when I work with writing students is it's not just what the words mean. It's not just about content. It's music. It's sound. It's rhythm. So that's what I'm kind of after today. The quirk of love, like a pin prick, a swizzle of sarsaparilla spraying heartfelt fizzle, flim flamming as if forever. The kink of desire, like a cowlick, a strawberry curl whirligig, -like spinning moonshine poppycock, midnight forget me nots. To this sublime idiosyncrasy, do I cross my heart, hope to, humor, and relish thee, till daffy down dillies do us part. Uh, okay, a sound talk. All right, let's see. Okay, is this one this other one I'm looking for? Uh, I'll do that one. Uh, just a second, no. Coming. Oh, okay. I'm looking for I thought I had it together. I put these yellow things in them. Right? But I don't want to find them. Okay. Loving the animals. I hummed like a bullfrog to your orangutan song. And he hawed, you ass, while you shook your rattle and rolled in my valley of the jolly green giant. You snorted like a somnambulant bull. I whinnied goat-like, and lickety-split, you spilled your soda pop. Mmm, good to the last drop, mon cher chimpanzee. Oh, how we hullabaloos. <laughs> So as you can see, these these are really fun for me, and um, I love the music of words. So um, let's see. Um, one more. Let's see. This is not quite as much, but um, it has some of it. Death of a graffiti artist. Before he slipped, he was spilling hot and spangly colors. Naked horse sassing in diamond studded brassieres, the paint just shooting out like jive from the spray gun held in his hand. His, his lightning legs lost their grease, oozing from the edge into darkness. Hell's yellow eye burned like fever until the light turned red, the train thundering loud as God's wrath. Mm. The woman followed after the policeman to whom to share her daughter, to, to, to where her daughter's, where her daughter Opal's son lay, his skinny rib cage crushed like ice. Mm. Trying to create a picture. And one more, this is very short, hard hat. The man's not a brute, though he howls and squawks, eyes glistening in carnivore heat at an ankle, a calf, breasts. 
His blood was a chaste red when the electrical needle wed a tender mermaid to his chest, tattooing his lust for life. And now I'll get the name right. Um, Jeannie Bassis is next. And then after that comes. Yeah. Okay. So a um, couple of things when you started doing your thing, Sonia. Got stuck in my head, the old John Prine song. Onomatopoeia, I don't want to see ya. <laughs> Can't remember the rest. Um, I got a little note on my phone, a little one of the little alert buttons just before I last started. And maybe somebody else got the same little button. But I just thought if you haven't gotten that little alert, you might want to know that our former president has also been indicted on three counts related to conspiracy and all that crap all of that January 6th. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yet more indictments. So, I thought I'd mention that. Um, so, I was here last, at the beginning of last month, it was right around the time, just a couple of days, uh, after my mom had passed away. And, um, she was 96, and she was in the old days. It was called a nurse. She was all the time. I was a kid growing up, and she taught me a lot of songs. So I used to be writing a lot of songs. A lot of them were Woody Guthrie songs. Um, and for those of you who don't know this, Woody Guthrie had family prior to the family that part of the dust three was a part of it. He had a brother and has a brother and a sister. Um, but prior to that, there was another family and he had a daughter and Kathy, who was a tragedy, died in the time when she was like, like three. And she wrote all these children's songs at that time. And this is one of them. It's really fine. So I'm going to teach you guys the chorus, even if you don't know it. Mm-hmm. It's called I'm going to nail myself to you. I feel like. Sarah. Oh, and also, so when you learn this song, it really helps to do the hand motions. All right? So the chorus goes like this. You ready? So let's like, think. I'm gonna wrap myself in paper. I'm gonna daub. Great word. We never say it. Daub myself with blue, right? Stick some stamps on the top of my head, right? Head. I'm gonna mail myself to you. I do this song with kids sometimes, and some of them have never put a package together. They've never mailed a package. Well, did you ever get a package? No. Did you ever get anything like from Amazon? Oh yeah. All right, I'm going to wrap myself in paper. I'm going to dog myself with blue. I want to see your body's moving because it looks so fun from up here. I'm going to wrap myself in paper. I'm going to dog myself with blue. Sticks on stamps on the top of my head. I'm going to nail myself. That sounds really good. Okay, I'll do the verses. We'll come back to your part. I'm gonna tie me up in red string. I'm gonna tie blue ribbons too. I'm gonna climb up in my nail box. I'm gonna nail myself to you. Ready to your part? Get those arms moving. I'm Self 
not to pick up the string and let me out and wash the blue off my fingers. Six months in my mouth. Here we go. I'm going to drown myself in paper. I'm going to drown myself in blue. Sticks up, stands on top of my head. I'm gonna bail myself here. Take me out of my wrap paper. Watch the stamps off my head. Pour me full of ice cream sodas. Tuck me in. This is your last chance. I'm going to write myself in paper. I'm going to write myself in blue. Sticks of stamps on the top of my head. And the thing that my mom loved more than anything was when people sang along. So when I would go through singing for her when she was there in the rehab center, she would always want to invite everybody over to listen and to sing with us. And there'd be people having lunch at the other table on the patio. I'm like, Mom, not everybody wants to do what we're doing. Yes, they do. <laughs> I have a little announcement. Um, I did announce this last month, but it's imminent at this point. Is um, I am starting a TV show on CTSB. Woo! Starting next Tuesday is going to be the first uh, recording of it. Um, it all started because I did the solo creatives. I'm number 41, by the way, in solo creatives. Um, CTSB's uh, program that's, I think, up to like 55 or something now. Joe, it's up there, right? Yeah. Yeah. And. Um, my show is going to be called In the Spirit of Play, which is the same name as my old radio show on WBCR, our community radio station. You can woohoo, that's okay with me, Eileen. Um, and so I'm, I'm looking to create literally a play shop on that, like things you've seen me do up here, getting people up here and letting your hair down and doing some fun things, only we'll be on TV. And there is the opportunity for um, the whole wide world to see it because it will be, of course, on YouTube, like I will it, you know. So, so I'm looking for people who might want to come play. I would like to, you know, not have you have everybody, which is kind of the crowd I hang out with, all be gray-haired and have a certain, you know, kind of not that diverse a population. But, um, you know, right. But I, I would love to invite any of you who might be interested. This, like I said, next Tuesday afternoon is the first one that I'm doing. Um, I have at least. Four people confirmed and two or three maybe. So I'm looking to have about seven or eight people each time to play. And they can always stop it and cut move things and we can stop things and cut things out and you know, but mostly it's gonna be like a just play experience. So if you think you're interested, wanna be on TV. And also I'll just mention it's not that I was a huge, huge fan, but I have much appreciation for his creativity. Pee Wee Herman just passed. Um, and he was somebody who was extraordinarily creative. So just, I he just, I thought yeah. I'd mention that. Yeah. He knew how to play. He knew how to play. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so now we have Larry Zingale, and Annie. Um, and after that, it will be Bob Gray. Okay. Hey, Bob. Hey, Bob. I don't need the mic. So I have a little short story, but uh, before I start, I want to relate something that uh, that uh, happened to me, and I was thinking about it this afternoon. I happen to be a painter, and when I had a show, uh, one man show, uh, the owner of the gallery wanted to buy one of the paintings. And um, I said, you know what? Why don't we do a trade? He had a Mazda Miata sports car, 
And she never showed, never. It was always parked behind the gallery. I said, how about letting me have that for a month and you can have the little painting? And so we made a deal. And um, I don't know if any of you have ever driven a little Mazda Miata. Well, they go. And they're, they're really a, they're a race car. So I had a lot of fun with it. And then this is the story. Uh, one day I was getting on the New York Thruway and I was going to get off the next exit, which was exactly 18 miles. And here's how nuts I was. I got on and I said, you know what? I'm not going to let anybody pass me. Uh, no one. Okay. Uh, now the speed limit is 60 miles an hour. Do you remember the last time you were on a speedway? Nobody goes 60. Right. Nobody, unless they're over 80 years old. Uh, this 65, 70, et cetera. So I said, no, 18 miles, no one's going to pass me. Now I'm going to ask you a question. How fast do you think I had to go for that to happen? 110. 110. No. 80. 100. 100. 100 miles an hour. And no I'm whizzing around everybody. No and when, you know, I didn't start at 100. I started at 70, and people still wanted to pass me. I go to 75, 80, they still wanted to pass me. And I thought, what does this mean? What is it about? And when I was about a half a mile from the exit, this was 18 miles, and nobody passed me. All of a sudden, a Corvette pulls up next to me, convertible, gives me a wave and takes off like I was standing still. <laughs> and then this is what I thought about. Anybody in a pickup, anyone in a pickup, if he's under 65 years old, he will try to pass you. Even if you're doing 80, he will try to pass you. Anyone in a Jeep who's under 65 years old will try to pass you. So the philosophy I came up with is this. Young people care about getting there. Old people get a, it's about enjoying the trip, actually seeing what's around you, the beautiful mountainside. And thank you for listening. So that was just an aside. So um, I have a little short story called The Lie. And here we go. Lie. They lay in bed, smoky, strumming the, the steel string. He always picked up the guitar afterwards and fooled with it. The window was open and the breeze off the lake had blown out the candle. In the quiet darkness, Hannah whispered, play something sweet, Smoke. Oh, I'm, I'm just messing around, he said. He was sleepy and a little too red wine loopy to come up with anything good. He fingered the C chord, progressed to an F, and finished up with, with a G. The notes fluttered up to the ceiling and faded into silence. She was warm and soft and naked, and she curled into him like a cat. Sing about us, she repeated, something sweet. Her eyes were closed. She slid her hand into his. Smokey picked out a different chord progression, fingered the notes, slow and easy, the late breeze cool on his face, and a song came to him. Not a new song, a song his father used to sing when the family took the Sunday drives in the shiny new Buick. Just Molly and me, and baby makes three. I'm happy in my blue heaven. Hannah slept. Smokey lit a cigarette and stepped outside onto the small back porch to look at the moon hanging over the lake and the distant pine trees. He enjoyed the aloneness and the smell of the night forest and the gentle quiet. He thought about the game he'd be pitching tomorrow against the Jayhawks. He had faced them once before, a nasty lineup, especially the middle three, Oaks, Flanagan, and Giglio. He was gone middle of the fourth. Giglio had scorched 
his fastball into the center field bleachers. Still, his arm felt pretty good, and he was sure he could get the job done. He was sleeping, uh, and then he wasn't. Hannah was sitting up, leaned against the wall, arms crossed over her breasts. She was staring at him. Smokey blinked. What is it, he said. He reached for the matches on the bedside table and relit the candle. Why'd you pick that song? What song? Blue Heaven. Why'd you pick it? I don't know. My old man used to sing it. She lay back down facing the wall. Smokey heard the soft sobbing in the dark room. He glanced at the alarm, 135. What's wrong, he said. He waited in the candlelight. And baby makes three, she said to the wall. What? He lit a cigarette. What the hell was she saying? Why are you crying? I'm two months late. Late for what? <laughs> she turned to him, scared. God, don't you get it? No. I'm pregnant. She stopped crying then and looked at him, waiting. Smokey said nothing, and then he said, who says? It was all he could think of. I missed two periods. Smokey stuffed out the cigarette, glanced at the alarm, 138. I never miss, never. Smokey slid out of bed, threw on a pair of jeans and a t-shirt, and slipped into his loafers. I need to take a walk, he said. A walk, she said, astonished. Are you coming back? <laughs> he closed the door quietly. He wasn't sure, but she might have been crying. Smokey walked to the lake, to the far side, where it reached the edge of the pine forest. He picked up a rock and threw a sidearm curve into dark water. It skipped and skipped again, and it sank into the darkness. He picked up another rock and threw his two-finger fastball. It whizzed in the night and skipped a number of times before it sank. Strike two, he said. He looked up and saw an eternity of stars. He looked into the forest, the rows of pines melting into blackness, and the forest told him nothing. He picked out a target, a birch tree he assessed to be 60 feet, six inches away, went into his windup and threw his bread and butter pitch, split finger slider, old reliable, hit the trunk dead center, waist high. It made a hard sound that echoed across the lake. Strike three, he said, you're out. The breeze turned cold, he shivered. He wanted a cigarette, but the pack was back in the room. Walking back along the edge of the lake, he said, Jesus Christ, I'm only 20. In the dark room, the candle still lit, he got into bed. He felt her warmth. She was awake. You came back, she said. Of course I came back, he said. I'm pitching tomorrow. Her hands covered her eyes, shoulders quivering. Jesus, Hannah, don't cry. I'm here, ain't I? What should we do? The crying didn't stop. I got a pitch, Hannah. Too loudly, he added, go to the doctor tomorrow. Find out what the deal is. I, I will. Her shoulders became still. It became quiet. And then she said, I'm probably worked up over nothing. Yeah, he said. Clara used to miss her period sometimes. Doctor said it was her diet. She was too skinny or something. Maybe, he said. He glanced at the young woman laying with him in the candlelight at the fullness, the rightness of her youthful body. The alarm read 222. He walked the first two batters on eight pitches. Coach Holinsky watched, sour-faced from the dugout steps. He motioned Huff to go to the mound and calm down his pitcher. What's going on? Huff asked. I can't find his own, Smokey said, sweating under the hot sun. Huff spit and wiped his mouth. Your mechanics are off. Let up a little, for Christ's sake. Your fastball's fast enough. There's no need to put mustard on it. He calmed down then and got Oaks on a pop-up. 
Flanagan chased a low curve for a third strike, and the dreaded Giglio grounded weakly to first. He was out of the inning. Hannah had made the hot chili he liked and served cold buds to wash it down. Afterwards, they sat on the porch and watched the sun go down. Two beers had mellowed smoky, and the sun was warm on his face. He felt good. He took off his shirt, lit a cigarette, and slumped down in the canvas chair. So he asked, you got any news for me? Yes, she said. He waited for her to keep talking, but she remained si silent. Well, he said, false alarm. She was looking out across the lake. He sat up straight, squinting against the red sun low in the sky. Are you sure the doctor said so? Dr. Seekamp, yes. Smokey closed his eyes, then opened them and flicked the cigarette over the porch railing. Good, he said, watching the cigarette burn. Hannah kept looking out across the lake. We won today, three to two, he said. I knew you won as soon as you came through the door, I always know. So what made you two months late? Dr. Seekamp said, probably stress. He was gone on a six day road trip, New Jersey, Delaware, Pennsylvania, then back to New York. The Sunday game was a rain out, which got him home late afternoon instead of the next morning. He was surprised to see Clara at the kitchen table knitting a scarf. She put down the yarn and knitting needles and said, what are you doing here? Rain out, he said. Thought you were coming back tomorrow. Where's Hannah? He said. In bed, sleeping. Sleeping? It's four in the afternoon. Don't wake her! Clara gathered the knitting stuff from the kitchen table and snatched her purse from the back of the chair. You bastard, she said. You prick! What the hell are you talking about? as if you didn't know. You're all the same. Her hand was on the doorknob. How could you let her go through that alone? I have no idea what you're talking about. And you have no idea what it's like. If you can't be a man about it, then keep it in your pants. When he was alone, he stood in the middle of the living room, staring at the closed bedroom door. The suitcase he was holding felt impossibly heavy. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Um, next we have Bob Gray, and then after that we'll have Steve. Larry had a real good story. I like that. And I had something serious, but I might read it anyhow. But. You can't be all serious all the time, can you? No. Um, I went to Mississippi to study William Faulkner years ago, and we were told besides studying, we should go down to, to the countryside to see what the life was like. Mm -hmm. And uh, OK, so we took some back roads, and we popped out in Gulfport. And right in front of us was a big sign that said, uh, Deep Sea Fishing Derby. No, no, Fishing Rodeo. That's what Fishing Derby would have been. So, <laughs> A deep sea fishing rodeo, which kind of all kind of great images of people riding dolphins and you know, <laughs> lasso and whales. But, but what it was, was a big tent about an acre in diameter, whatever area, square. And they were all ice tables with every sort of fish imaginable you can think of, all with their eyes look. And that was the rodeo. There was a kids' division and a women's division. But anyhow, that was a letdown. But we headed for the midway. And uh, this my friend, three of us went down in my F-250 down from Hattiesburg. And uh, Brian was from Kansas and Trevor was from New Zealand and uh, it was me. And anyhow, we hit the midway and Brian saw a tent that had an ex exhibit of people who had been bitten by poisonous snakes. <laughs> and <laughs> swear to remember, this is Mississippi. <laughs> You gotta remember that. Uh, Trevor never had a corn dog, and they had foot-long corn dogs there, so we had a corn dog. 
And I saw this sign that said, Dangerous Pig and World's Smallest Horse. And I said, that's for me. <laughs> so I went in, and there was this pig, about the size of a sofa, <laughs> pink with bl blotches on it, tusks coming out of his mouth like a wild boar, and a fan blowing on it while it lay on this uh, straw, <laughs> panting. And next to it was a little compartment with a dog about the uh, a dog, a horse about the size of a police dog. <laughs> Big bulging eyes. Strange. So there's a guy in like three month old greasy jeans running the exhibit. And I said to him, <laughs> I said, This really the world's largest pig? He said, Oh shit, no, I got one twice the size at home. <laughs> and I said <laughs> and I said, uh, is he mean? That shows bullshit. He ain't mean. In fact, he and the dog are best friends. The, I keep saying the dog. It's just dog. He and the horse are best friends. Okay, and I said, well, you know, a dangerous pig that isn't dangerous, a second-rate pig, and, and friends with a bug-eyed dog about the size of a German shepherd, that's enough for me. So we headed back, and I was going to tell my story, but Brian was just focused on what he'd seen from the venomous snakes, people skin rotting and so forth. And Trevor had to finish his corn dog, so we got in the truck and went. But anyhow, let's see. Hamlet, remember Hamlet said, uh, oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. Okay. Now he was upset because after all his uncle had killed his father, and then they got married, or they wanted to get married, they wanted Hamlet, his mother and his uncle. And Hamlet uh, was really upset with this, which you can understand. And he said, oh, that this too, too solid flesh should melt. Now, I said that to myself, but I didn't have any problem with infidelity or incense. My pants were too tight. <laughs> uh, which is something. And so I, I've tried losing weight a lot. I've probably lost 400 pounds. I'm really good at it. And I think in some parallel universe, I probably exist in another corporeal state with my uh, cells all put together again. But that's the end of it. I'm not fat anymore, at least too much. But anyhow, as far as the story goes, I can tell you about my friend, the Fuge. We call him the Fuge after the Fugitive because he had but one arm. And <laughs> he was all right, Fuge. He had lost it in a, in a car accident. And in place of his left arm, he had a flipper, we called it. The thing would move under his shirt. Mm -hmm. Now, Flipper had his right arm, and we always take him to umpire our softball games because he could only call strikes. <laughs> strike, strike. You know, he couldn't call balls because he had no left arm. Yeah. If you know baseball, you're not. But anyhow, we, <laughs> I had a car with a station wagon, a Ford, which for some reason they called a country sedan. It was a station wagon. Well, we, had a, we put Fuge in the back. And because he couldn't balance himself, he just had one arm, he would roll from side to side in the back of the car when we went around the corner. And <laughs> that was fun too, but anyhow, we also had an old mattress back there and somebody was smoking them up right on Route 102 by the, I don't know, it used to be a big paper mill. My grandfather worked there, but that's another story. And the, the, the um, roach set the mattress on fire. Not fire, but you know, smoldering, stinky mattress smoke. So we kicked that out of the back on the highway. I don't know if it might still be there. I don't know. But anyhow, I was going to read something about hawks, which is kind of grim in a way, because, well, I like to see hawks. And I take a walk. I try to take a walk. Well, no, don't walk much anymore. This was a few years ago. But people were always on the main trails. We used to walk on the power line up, to, up between the mountains. And sometime, even though I didn't have any people around, I would be gifted by kinetic and, and spare and nasty hawks who reminded me of a time they in the air and glinting in their fang or their um, fangs and tucks. I'm thinking the pig with their beak and their claws and so forth. And I loved them for company because they are of another world, a world where man still believed in gods and where man used to uh, live the same way the hawks did by talent and strength and wit. One time I'd gone to New Bedford, the old Budwood Park Zoo, and there was a hawk there in a 10-foot square cage, and a pigeon wandered into the cage, and the hawk pounced on it immediately and tore it into 
obscene bloody pieces and devoured it right in front of us. Which was amazing to me, because even though he was a captive in a small cage, he still had that instinct. Which is why when you see old people, old people, oh God, when you see old time pictures of people hunting with hawks, the hawk lands on their gauntlet after he's caught a hare, we'll say. They have to take the hare away real quick and give him some meat, tame meat, like a piece of beef or something. Because if they didn't do it quickly and well, what would happen? The hawk would figure out he didn't deign to serve man like a dog. All right, so it had to be done quickly. But anyhow, I will read a little bit of it. I would have read the whole thing, but it was too serious. You didn't mind me telling a couple stories, did you? No. All right. I'll read it if I can find my glasses. I even wrote this in 14-point type, and I still can't read it. Okay. The way I think about it now is earthbound in the shadows beneath the now empty sky, I'm just a man. And even more, I'm a man who lives in a world from which the gods are gone. The hawk's presence is fleeting, but their image remains, making a simple walk special and conjuring a lifetime of memories and dreams. Now, the whole thing goes on like that, you know, hawks and doing terrible things. But there's a poem by Robertson Jeffers. Robertson Jeffers called Hurt Hawks. And it has to do with a hawk whose wing has been broken irreparably. And uh, Rappers and Jeffers, you know, says that the first stands that dogs won't go near it, cats won't go near it, the foxes, because the hawk still remains its, retains its ferocious aspect. And I thought I'd read the second stanza because it makes sense to go along with everything I've said here. I'd sooner accept the penalties kill a man than a hawk, but the great red tail had nothing left but un, what kind of misery was it? Unable misery. From the bones too shattered for mending, the wing trailed under his talons when he moved. When he had, we had fed him for six weeks, I gave him freedom. He wandered over the far forehand hill and returned in the evening asking for death, not like a beggar, still eyed with the old implacable arrogance. I gave him, a lead, I gave him the lead gift in the twilight. What fell was relaxed, owl diamond, downy, soft feminine feathers. But what soared? The fierce rush, the night herons by the flooded river cried fear at its rising before it was quite unsheathed from reality. Thank you. Then I got another short, funny sort of song. Raise your voice for the freedom you'll be heard all across this land. Raise your voice for freedom. Take your neighbor's hand. Raise your voice for freedom. We've been fighting these wars too long. Raise your voice for freedom. You'll be heard all across this land. Raise your voice for the children who go hungry every night. Raise your voice for the mothers who will never give up the fight. Raise your voice for the soldiers sacrifice their life. Raise your voice for freedom. You'll be heard all across this land. Raise your voice. Raise your voice. You'll be heard all across this land. Raise your voice for the homeless who hope for one more chance. Raise your voice for the families still living in 
Song, probably, maybe. Some of us got old bones. Huh? <laughs> old bones, it's a George Burns song. I've got to play it for some people that uh, uh, they line dance and they take lessons to line dance. And the lady that runs it says, Can you play Old Bones for us someday? I says, Yeah, we'll give it a whirl. So uh, let's see how this goes. Old Bones.
but I love life I'd like to do it again Though I might not be much more than I've ever been Just to have a chance to turn back the hands and let my life begin Oh yeah I'd like to do it again Oh yeah I'd like to do it again all right, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Very good voice. Okay, my name's Kitty Kiefer. Are you carpet bagging? I well, I have a prop. <laughs> People have props occasionally. And then after me, I don't see Jerry Barnrick. Is he here anywhere? Hiding? Keyboard. So then in that case, um, I will be looking after me, okay? All right, there you are. Okay. Anyway, so my prop. <laughs> a jar of dinos. It's a bucket of dinos. Okay. All right. <clears throat> my name is Grog, and I am a grandmother of a boy who turned three in July and of another boy who will be one in October. They and their direct ancestors visited the weekend before last. I have a bucket of dinosaurs, <laughs> about 40 dinos, hard plastic in a clear plastic bucket. I also have a sturdy wooden house for stuffed animals, human <laughs> figures with beds, little pillows, and various furnishings for all the different rooms that are usually found in a house. I also have various matchbox metal cars, trucks, and earth moving equipment. A few animal puppets, an old McDonald tractor and trailer with animals that fit in special footprints on the trailer, and many, many books. There is plenty to do at my house for, for the three-year-old. Crescendo is a word of intention that hints at musical performance and volume. Crescendo implies an increase in volume of the sound until something is resolved or redeemed or finished. Other words that describe sounds with increased volume are cacophony, commotion, blast, crash, racket, and sometimes din. <clears throat> when crescendo is mentioned, I usually think of Tchaikovsky's 1812 overture music written to celebrate the Russian defeat of Napoleon Bonaparte's army near Moscow in 1812. The piece was written in 1880 and first performed then. The volume of the piece builds, the intensity increases, and the crescendo occurs with cannons being fired, drums, bells, and brass calling out. This has elements of crash, boom, blast, but it's actually planned rehearsed. In a word, it's orchestrated and repeatable. This music was written to celebrate the end of war. <clears throat> the war was finished. The unknown threats, violence, danger, and ragged weeks and months were over. Done. So the crescendo in the overture reminded the audience of the war, <clears throat> but the sounds redeemed and amended the fears found in memories and reassured the audience that now is different. No more threat. Napoleon was gone and his troops were too. The suffering of the Russians was over and the suffering of the French was removed to Poland and then to Western Europe. The bucket of dinosaurs. There are many different, <clears throat> many different kinds of dinosaurs in the bucket. Different combinations of dinos make different stories. Stories cannot grow and evolve while the dinos stay in the bucket. When Clay, my grandson, first arrived, the dinos were immediately seized and the bucket dumped. I won't do that. A cascade, a commotion of dinosaurs. Then silence. He picked up, sorted, studied. You could see he was thinking hard. Then he began to murmur and place them. 
on the sofa, on the table, on a chair, under the sofa. The pterodactyl began to fly. The T. rexes, there are two, were prominent. The others were grazing or running somewhere or sleeping in the house. After we ate supper, he and his brother had a bath and went to bed. I picked up all the dinosaurs and put them back in their bucket. Picked up all the other things and returned them to their places on the edge of the room. We all went to bed. I slept, the others not so much. But because I'm deaf in one ear and sleep with the good ear down in these circumstances, I miss any din, commotion, clamor, or racket. And I missed the crescendo of Eden, the less than one-year-old, as his mother quieted him and he breastfed until he slept again. I woke early and went down to the kitchen to make coffee and what we call eat meal, which everyone else I know calls oatmeal. <laughs> Clay and his dad arrived about 6.30. <clears throat> I told Adam gently to go back to bed. And Clay and I had cut up strawberries, a banana, some blueberry kefir, and lots of eat meal. We then went to the living room to read some books, one about a boy who took a, a three-year nap, one about a pig who was learning to count, another about a coyote who had a grandfather. Clay was leaning on the sofa, and I was sitting on it. I watched his eyes move around the poised toys. The eyes rested on the bucket of diners. <laughs> trotted over and brought the bucket back to the sofa, opened the top, and gradually, with increasing volume, using his hands and gravity, got all the creatures out of the bucket and onto the floor. A crescendo of dinosaurs. The excitement was now for him in the story that he was going to make. I held the book that we were reading, and he shut it for me. I continued to hold it, and he started the building of the stage and the, and the set. Then his mom and little brother arrived, and we all went into the kitchen so that Eden could have eat meal, strawberries, and a banana. I think the difference between crescendo and cacophony, or clamor, or crash, or even racket is important. Very important when you are three and change. To begin to build and create is my definition of growing up. Certainly the tools and skills we develop change as we grow but to have the space and time to evolve a crescendo is a big, consistent gift that this grandmother, this grung, can give. They left on Sunday after lunch to drive back to Boston. I got a text from them apologizing for the mess they make. I immediately texted back that as soon as the car seats are buckled, the mess making is over. Mm. All I have to do is pick up the pieces mm. and wait for Clay and Eden to return. Mm. And I always set up spaces for crescendos. Mm. <laughs> I am now turned on. Don't get too excited. Okay, no one got that joke, All right? Um, so, you know, I love to be loud. I don't know about crescendo. I start loud, I end loud, you know? And I'm learning, as long as I show up with kindness and patience and my enthusiasm is for good, not evil, it's okay to be loud. It's really okay to be loud. Some people might misunderstand me, but someday maybe they'll see the genius behind it. But it's just who I am. This is a story I wrote a long, you know, I started writing about four years ago. Um, and this is a story, the first one where I felt, hmm, I don't know. I don't know. It, it, it's different than what I usually write, but it reminds me of a time in my life where it wasn't okay to be a crescendo. It was only okay to be a flat line. He woke, it's called The Gap. He woke up miles past his stop, disoriented. Slowly opening his eyes, he was keenly aware of how tightly they had been shut. He felt as if his whole body had been on lockdown as the hazy flurry for fluorescent lights came into focus he saw the number 1212 in black letters on the wall train car number 1212 
Stretching his long arms, he paid careful attention not to bump his fellow commuter. He didn't like to be bothered, hence he didn't bother others. There were no others. The seats crammed at maximum, maximum capacity leaving the city were now empty. Another man would have panicked, frantically checked his pocket for his wallet, his phone, would look at his feet for his briefcase, wonder how long he had been asleep. Not this guy. He glanced at his phone, no messages. Another man would have questioned why no one was looking for him, why no one missed him. Not this guy, he was pleased. For over 26 years, he rode this railroad, day in, day out, from his nondescript bedroom community into the big city. Each morning at 6.50 a.m. and home on the 5.40 p.m. That is if he was lucky enough to have the streetlight gods in his favor, rushing block by block to the underground terminal, thousands of commuters crawling like ants through the mazes of stairs, newsstands, and delis. The terminal a pass through, it was the train that was his destination. Stepping over the gap, he entered into a place of ease, a dividing point. He was oblivious to the signage, a huge graphic showing a, a man in a suit, just like him with one leg in the gap. A bold slanted red line slashed through the picture. Translation, warning, don't be this guy. Do not get stuck in the gap. Yes, that gap, the six inches between the train platform and the silver doorframe housing the automatic doors that concave into the train's interior, signaling this is a sacred sphere. Once over the gap, he could breathe. It was his religion, akin to a baseball player reaching for the base with a long stride, stomping his foot as hard as he can on the plate, looking to see the umpire wave him in safe. As his left foot touched down inside the doorframe, he took a deep breath in. To others, it may have been odd that he felt at home with the tr stale train air, that distinct train smell comforting. Fingers touching newspapers, sweet ink, wet ink emitting through the air as commuters robotically turn pages, droplets of burnt coffee oozing from cheap paper cups sporting the logo, world's best coffee, the brown sticky li liquid hardening in gooey beads on the gritty laminate, lingering perfume scents from well-dressed women, sour body odor releasing from laborers after long shifts working in boiler rooms or with heavy machinery, each with two cans of beer, sinking into the uncomfortable pleather seats, carelessly dropping their empties by their feet. The cans roll around, passengers unconsciously kick them as they rush to find their place for the ride home. Then as the train gets into gear and lurches forward, inertia pushes them. Just like each commuter searching for a seat, each can searching for a landing spot. Amber liquid drizzles out as the cans roll, making the floor slick, sticky and slippery like a dive bar at closing time. All of these smells, the sweet and sour, intermingling as if they know it is their only chance to connect, to truly see each other, coming and going, passing through the seats on car 1212. Arriving at his office, he sat silently in the cubicle on the 18th floor of a 22-store building, 22-story building in the middle of a busy city. Over the padded wall, he could see across the street, another building very much the same as his. His mind wondered about that office. Was the copy a faster? Did they have more pastries? Did the bosses take longer to martini lunches and pay less attention to their staff? Would working there provide even less accountability for his daily tasks, his accounting of other people's lives, entering transactions, sorting categories, and making reports? Another man might have thought about pay rate. Could he earn more than the other at the other office to support his family? Would think about career advancement and opportunities to excel in his chosen field, about solvency and prospects. Not this guy. Not this guy who needed the putrid train smell to tell him who he was, to make him realize that it was only in transit that he fully existed. 
This morning, his empty soda, th that morning, his empty soda can hit the garbage pail rim and bounced to the floor. His coworkers lifted their heads above their partitions to see what was going on. He silently shook his head from side to side. Once the commotion settled down, he heaved himself up from his office chair, picked up the renegade can and placed it firmly in the garbage without making a sound. He was used to not making a sound. On the train heading home, with no one looking over his shoulder, he could breathe, really breathe. That is where he felt free. He could be fully inside himself with nothing on either side. Inside the train, the only place to go, either the stinky restroom or a bold move to another seat in another car. There was no way out until the double door slid open with a smooth motion into the wall of the train. At that moment, it closed again. He felt whole. This day was not in particular. It was curious to him that he missed his stop, slept through the entire train ride home. This did not happen often, more precisely, that is to say, it rarely happened. As he stepped out into the cold, dark night air at the last stop on the line, he was surprised, dismayed, to come face to face with his wife. And then, of course, Jenny. Ooh, and Amelia. We have Jenny and Amelia, or we have Jenny and? <laughs> to be determined. Jenny and Amelia. Jenny and Amelia. Okay, so Jenny Clark and Amelia. And you can sort of last <laughs> Just push this over here a little bit. <laughs> no expectations, guys. <laughs> Amelia, I just want to see you get on the motorcycle. What's that? I want to see you get on the motorcycle. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Where'd she go? Come back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> we need to just beef up on the tune. It's pretty quick. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, kid, kid, kid. So. All right. We're a couple of swells. We stop at the best hotels. <laughs> We, we prefer the, the country far away from the city smells. <laughs> We're a couple of sports. We're the pride of the tennis courts. In June, June July, July, and August, August we look cute in our tennis shorts. shorts. The Vanderbilts have a sauce of for tea. We don't know how to get there. No sorry. No sorry. We would drive up the avenue, but we haven't got the price. We would skate up the avenue, but there isn't any ice. We would ride on a bicycle, but we haven't got a bike. So we'll walk up the avenue, yes, we'll walk up the avenue, yes, we'll walk up the avenue till we're there. Okay, now our part. We're a couple of swells. Oops, wrong side. <laughs> Start over. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> We're a couple of swells. We love to show and tell. And we are here because we have news 
It's time to ring the bell. Oh, you brought one. Okay. <laughs> We're a couple of sports. We realize that life is short. But art is long and aren't drawn to think we have lost our gourds. It turns out we have something that we share. And maybe you can guess it if you dare, if you dare. Both our mommies for us. Both our mommies for us. Born us on the 4th of August. Both our mommies bore us on the 4th of August. And we know well, our signs are similar because we share the very date. Don't look now, but the birthday cake's out front and it's carrot cake. <laughs> So we'll celebrate our friendship, and we hope that you will join us. A big bow, well, well to I well, and all of us, and all of us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Oh, yes. Do you know about August 4th? Is your birthday August 4th? Yes. Yeah, we're both, we're both August 4th. Yay. True story. How do you like that? Who figured that one out? Yeah. We just we just were so happy to, to figure it out. So it looks like we have a new contestant. Right. Why can you stay there? Because I'll be useful with you. Oh, how fun. Okay. I just want to make these announcements for the team. Is she going to do something? Yes, yeah. yeah. Hmm? This is Rosalind Reese will now join, join the okay. class. Okay. Yeah. Let's move out of here. Before sitting what? here. Why? Because Rosie wants to. Yeah. So, um, what you got? What well, you got? What I, you got? I, will, will you be a star for me? Of course I'm oh. a star. Okay. <laughs> Great. So you can just go near Jenny. And will you be a tree? Yes. That's okay. Mm -hmm. And I'd like a moon, please. A moon? A moon, like the moon. What does the moon have to do? Well, okay. you, can, you can just stand here and be the moon. Okay. Come on, moon. Yay. Well, you don't have to moon us. Yeah. No, you don't. You don't even have to hold a pose. Really? Okay. Really. Um, so this is a little song, and I, I just have, I have a class on Tuesday nights, and I went onto my porch, and I, <clears throat> I was singing this to the trees and the stars and moon, and then it was like I so wanted to sing it to all of you. Um, so I'm here singing it to all of you, and it's, it's a little lullaby that I just made up to the trees and the stars and the moon. <clears throat> so it goes. And it's really just my lullaby to everyone here. Mm -hmm. And we also have a, a full moon tonight, so take, take note of that. But this is my lullaby to all of you. <clears throat> oh, I'm a little nervous. <clears throat> it's easier to sing to the trees and the stars and the moon than human beings sometimes. <laughs> anyway. Good night to the trees and stars and moon. Good night to the swaying branches. Good night to the trees and stars and moon. I thank you for playing your part in my life and I bid you a peaceful evening and night. Good night to the trees and the stars and moon. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. Good night to the stars and sun and moon. Good night to the trees in front of my room. 